This week we're in Los Angeles, and I'm on my own, so I'm MacGyvering it a bit, so bear with me. <laughs> we're at the Fold Gallery and Curie Shop in downtown Los Angeles, an incredible community gallery highlighting the work of local artists, as well as specializing in vintage and rare finds. It also happens to be right above the last bookstore, an equally incredible treasure trove of books and music. And speaking of incredible, I have three incredible people to share with you in this week's special edition, including musical and poetry performances. But first, an ode to LA. Welcome to the fog, the clog of humanity, down the drain sanity, search for your clarity in feng shui parodies, in concrete confines, plastic spires, and silicone high-rises. Congestion, a mass misdirection, suggestions from questioning eyes, jealous minds, work harder, get thinner, skip dinner, rush hour, happy hour, scour this desert for signs of real life. Could you define real? What is fake when you make a new person, a happy new version, a dreamscape dispersion? Like crop-dusting deserts, what did you hope would take root? This place needs a reboot, a break from the cool, but that point is moot when bright young things with starry eyes and nicely gapped thighs come flocking and hoping and dreaming and waiting. Who's gonna spring for change when shrines for the same make me like they are built every day? What can you do? What can you say? It just gets cliche. Even insults come out like Botox, hardly new and stiffly stale. And the smile, perfectly placed in a place where you're great, flies from the lips of uncaring dips who ironically long to hear it for real. For real, though. The hipster ironic, the devil's own tonic, a dirty martini, a fat-free crust crustini, a jet fuel inhale, namaste exhale. Can you feel anything? Billboards on sunset, surfers at sunrise, downtown at rush hour, sprinting through Beverly Hills, I caught wind of the painfully still. The unmoving clutch to all that glitters, yes, gold. The vapid and bold, the rich somehow sold, the hot somehow cold, this high, a new low. Tourists snap pictures of walls, hoping to see a glimpse from the silver screen. What a sight to behold, a person out walking or driving by, tinted windows, gas guzzling shy, a hummer this summer, blowouts and blowjobs, high life and Wi-Fi, kombuchas and green juice, recycle and reuse, the same plastic morals. Now in a green tote, totes the style this season. A reason to buy, not to brag, but you will. Name drop and still, line up for callbacks, stress on a show day, waiting to sound check, the sound guy in old rec, say your lines, play your set, get off stage, next, next, next. Ten years like a red carpet flash, being back, seeing the people that pass, I can tell who's new. I can tell who, like me, has toyed with the notion that this here love potion is wearing off. And where off to next? Do you let your dreams die, let them drip from the Hollywood sign, evaporate like the rain we never do get? Do you refashion, recapture, remake your path, align your success less with the stars and more so with mantras and self-help cards? I see those wheels turning, the wiser ones learning like I did, that this place won't cave to deep thinkers, truth diggers. It's built on complicity, a deep-seated sick belief that fame and fortune is all you ought want, all that you need. That greed for yourself is the ultimate wealth, and helping others is good for Instagram tweets. Post, don't repeat, till you need a PR campaign to show that you're humane. So really, I guess it's a bit like DC with a silver screen. So I didn't learn, did I? From tweets to marching in the streets, this is ACT OUT. Welcome to ACT OUT, I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your tipping point, and this, as I mentioned, is LA. Despite my not-so-glowing rendition of a fallen angel's condition, we have quite an awesome show for you, because there are quite a few awesome people hiding here. First up, Peter Joseph. You may recognize his name from the Zeitgeist series because, well, he created it. His artistic exploration of the fixed capitalist system continues, and he is now working on a new trilogy called Interreflections. I got a chance to sit down with him in his studio to talk about the new films and his artistic and technical expression. Take a look. You know, the whole idea of Zeitgeist is a, a paradigm shift. So what do you feel that people should do if they, you know, because a lot of people have watched these films and have had a paradigm shift. What would you suggest they do? Like, what is the next step then? That's the hardest question and something that we all in the movement think about <laughs> consistently and I wish I was a prophet to, uh, to know where the next step is, but obviously it's galvanizing. You need to have people come together with a very central focus. You have a very disparate and um, disconnected 
rights movement across the world. And that's really what it is, by the way. You can talk about sustainability, you can talk about um, all the inhumanity, but they all come down really to a civil and human rights imperative because it's not the planet that's gonna be injured by our behavior, it's us, clearly. It's so the, all of the, the sustainability movements need to come together with the social activist movements and realize that they have the, the same protocols. And I guess that's what I would say, it's a unification. If you need to look at the components of what has created change in the past and apply those components to today, and, and people have criticized them of being technocentric, say, well, you know, with abundance and automation, and it's really not about the technology, it's about what the technology means to human society as far as creating an alleviation of stress. And that's that stress that keeps us being rude and has a cult, we have a culture of sociopaths in the world today. It's a self-interest generating type of problem and it's all coming from the environment. It's not that human nature isn't in, isn't in play, it's that it's pinging the worst of our nature over and over again. We are selfish, we've backed into a corner, we can operate and, excuse me, behave in a very, a very narcissistic and, and uh, uh, inhumane way. Any, any of us are capable of that. So it's really the condition that we're all in that will, will change that. How do you see technology being a part of this paradigm shift? And, and could that push us towards, or how could that push us towards this uh, more global paradigm shift and to get to um, that space that the Zeitgeist Movement speaks about? Uh, how it's allocated right now, the majority of the technology as it has been for the past 40 to 50 years, if not much, much longer, it all goes towards security and military. military. Almost all the R&D in this country of the major universities, the first stop is for the military industrial complex. And there's no doubt in my mind when you, when you compare the war technology, in fact, that's a premise in my new film, when you take the war technology and if you just simply look at what the capacity is and the efficiency and then you were able to apply that same energy uh, to uh, the things that would actually create living re, in the words of Fuller, up in re versus living re, then you clearly could alleviate the vast majority of stress. And the application of technology for the absolute wrong reasons is, a, is one of the most core characteristics of, of the U.S. You're going to have a new presidential election. They're going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars on this stuff over the course of time, over the course of the four years, when you put in the congressional things and everything else. And all of that money could be applied to something that clearly could have more value. You could easily solve U.S. poverty, give everyone a universal guaranteed income with all of that. And that's a form of technology, if you think about it. Technology isn't just the materials and the tools. It's actually the way we think. It's actually methods and processes. Uh, science is a technology. It's used to, to derive information and apply it. Technology is just our, our ability to create and think and elevate to new levels. It doesn't, have to be, it doesn't have to be physical. And we clearly don't know how to use our brains properly. At least the social system doesn't facilitate us to use our brains properly because it's based on these old, old traditions and obviously elite power preservation. Right, and of course the, the education system only speaks to that concept of the, the continuous dumbing down. We're not getting smarter, we're, we're being asked to get dumber and dumber. Uh, so you mentioned your, your new film, Inter Reflections. Talk a little bit about um, the, uh, not, not so much the genre, but talk a little bit about why it, how it's different than, than the, the three films that you did earlier and um, what, what exactly is the, if there's like a, a specific plot? I mean, you mentioned the military industrial complex. Uh, so speak a little bit about that. About a plot, it's, well, it's abstract. So um, I've, I can't give away too much with it because <laughs> I want it to be the surprise that it will be. But it's a multi-genre work. It, it's gonna combine concepts of documentary, concept of, of satire, comedy, even the strange element of horror and thriller. Uh, and it kind of comes out of left field. It's sort of like a David Lynchy approach, but not as not as blatantly abstract. It by the end of the film and by the end of the trilogy, you're going to be set up with a a number of of um, of, in, of interpretive elements that hopefully hopefully will not only have its kind of core average logic by the end, but also will inspire all sorts of different things in the minds of people. That's why I appreciate about the arts is that everyone gives a different interpretation. My first film, which was the most artistic of all three of the Zeitgeist films, because I was, it was very abstract, because it was designed as a music piece initially, I don't know if many people knew that, but it wasn't actually a documentary performance piece in the traditional sense. It was designed to be experienced in a live setting when I actually had instruments. And that one, to this day, is like the Rorschach of, of, all, of the entire thing. And it blows my mind to see how, for better or for worse, how the interpretations of that film come out. But I appreciate that element of uh, chaos in, in the art form. And I think rather than just lining things up and 
creating the narrative and making the story, like there is a story about a, a, a subculture activist group that rises up and over the course of the three films, a huge global transition occurs. That's the basic theme, fairly cliche. It's been used throughout many sci-fi films and good versus evil and the like. But um, within that, there's a, a deep social criticism and a, a deep uh, aesthetic. And ideally, ideally, it's going to work just as I said before. It's going to work as, a, as an inspiration piece, as a social criticism piece, and also as a technical piece. There are certain elements in the film trilogy as a whole, because it's going to be approached as such, that do show people uh, exactly how things could work uh, in the future. It will work on multiple levels. I think people will see it. And the, the most foundational level where have, people have no familiarity with the concepts, so they'll be able to get it. And then there will be a really deep level that you know, will be full of, of, of uh, extremely Im important content and social criticism that uh, will work for the more veteran kind of zeitgeister, if you will, I suppose. I don't know. For more information on Peter and his upcoming project, check out innerreflectionsmovie.com and peterjoseph.info. Moving on, it may not be very surprising that the system status quo makes me cry. However, when what you really gets the tear ducts working is the fact that it's delivered in a twistedly, beautifully, beautiful, powerfully, unapologetic, poetically pointed way, just dripping with raw emotion, you might wonder what the fuck I'm talking about. Well, as I like to say, instead of telling you, I'll just show you. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Cedillo. Here is a nation, packaged complete. Police escort skinheads and hooded clansmen to march hate down public streets. Well, those very same police orders to meet cannon fire on black boys and hoodies and Mexican kids with shaved heads. They are killing our kids. Well, half the nation applauds in the homeland's defense. Because they think, they think that a white woman's purse has more value than the black or brown woman's life. Here is a nation helping 1%. Genocide pipeline from underfunded schools to overcrowded prisons, they knew Gingrich our kids ain't fit for nothing but a life in and out of the system stripped of innocence guilt by birth certificate students. Orders before children, children, suspects before students, young girls, whores before victims. Here's a nation that eats its young. This is not a democracy. This is not a republic. This is an open air prison, an industrial scale plantation. Anything and everything you've ever gotten from this system as a mathematical assessment, a calculated equation set to the algorithm of the cost of doing business, keep your hands moving, stomach consuming, mind functioning within the narrow confines of your job description, blood soaked country, forged in genocide, built on slavery by a den of thieves, posing as Messiah, the Constitution, Thomas Jefferson, Jefferson Davis, why Jesus, Western civilization, civilized mission, mission accomplished, manifest destiny, American exceptionals, and peculiar institutions, institutionalized racism, declaration to plantation, anthem to slave ship, the bicentennial, your back to the slave, look at the feet of Lady Liberty, the dirt poor, dead tired, huddled child, living from the popular tenements of Ellis Island to Arizona's blood red, coyote trails, the traffic in brown flesh, brick by brick, grave by grave, inch by inch, slave by slave. Here is a nation, there are its chains. Keep you in place, watch tower, overseer, agent killer, you will be bust, and part of the ism, patriot act, acting in, just of national defense, which if you would stand against it, which hunt for was alone, who said that, who did that, which side are you on? Here is the firing squad, they killed Meta Comets, they killed Tecumseh, they killed Pieta, they killed John Brown, they killed that turner, they killed the Rosenbergs, they killed Sokka and Benzetti, Malcolm X, and more of the King, the Cuba from Salazar, they killed Fred Hampton, they were to kill in much the same fashion. Here are the blood soaked fields to claim the life of Andy Lopez, Presidio Flores, Susie Pena, Mike Brown, Latasha Hart, and Trayvon Morton Act. The nation applauded. Here is that nation. This is not a democracy. This is not a republic. This is the state of the union. They are killing our children. We are war. This is a call to us.
And if that doesn't play your emotions like Ray Charles played the piano, then you have no soul, or at least no central nervous system. After Matt's poem, I had the opportunity to sit down with him and talk poetry, politics, and his own path to the spoken word stage. Take a look. We are here with Matt Cedillo at the Cielo Gallery and Studios in downtown Los Angeles, and he just performed, and I cried, and uh, so now that that's over, <laughs> and I've composed myself, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us, Matt. Your, your poetry is intense, amazing. It's every emotion in the human register at once. Uh, how did you get started doing poetry? Uh, well, you know, I actually wanted to be a writer when I was, like, really young, and um, I want to be a novelist, but that takes a lot of time. And, you know, I was like 14 years old and that, that was like kind of like not, that didn't quite work out. Um, and then so I had to work and, um, and then in the process of working, I still had these dreams of, you know, artistic aspiration. But, um, but you know, things kind of went south in my life and I ended up homeless and I did start all this political study. And after that, I became very serious about like I was going to be this, you know, political activist and put away the, the dreams of being a bourgeois artist. This is ridiculous, right? And so... Um, and so that was my idea, right? So I was going to start writing pamphlets and doing all this stuff like that. And um, what ended up happening was my friend, we went to May Day March, and, I, and a friend of mine took me to a poetry reading afterwards, and I saw political, someone doing some political poetry. And I was like, okay, I can do that. And um, what ended up happening is I actually made a lot of friends, and I, and I made uh, a lot of connections, and I got to uh, travel around a lot. Um, I made some slam teams. I was in the LA Times. A couple other things happened. So um, more and more, I just kind of loosened up, and I and also just realized that, you know, these things are interconnected and that life is, you know, your life is your life and you shouldn't like compartmentalize these things and that, you know, your artistic passions and your drive to see a better world or for me anyways, my artistic passions, the idea to, to see a better world, um, were not in contradiction with one another. So I'm curious, you said um, that you became homeless and then you sort of became political. Were you pol political before that or did your experience as someone who's homeless really define your activism and your political uh, stature? Uh, well, what happened was, um, you know, before that, I was actually, I don't want to say anti-political, but I, I was somewhat apolitical, and I was actually uh, kind of, I mean, I kind of had this idea that I was going to make art, and that was, like, really this higher calling or something like that. Um, it was kind of ridiculous. And then uh, what had happened was uh, I ended up, you know, I ended up in a situation where, um, you know, I was in my car, I was living in my car, and I didn't know how I was going to do, and it was just in Dallas, and so I ended up uh, out there, and it's very hot out there, and so I, I spent my time in the library. And, um, and, I, and I started reading these books to figure out what had happened because my whole life I've been told how smart I was. And then, like, um, I just didn't understand, like, how I could end up in this position. And so then I started reading about, you know, economics and stuff like that. And so um, that eventually led me to reading Marx and all kinds of other stuff. So that made me really, like, okay, I, I get it now. Like, I, I was, I'm, part of this, I'm part of this larger things that exist outside of my, my – whether or not I'm aware of them, I'm, a, I'm part of something bigger than myself. And, and I started to understand that. Um, and once I once I got that, you know, being you know, I'm kind of obsessive by nature, so I got really obsessive. And I started reading, 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 and um, and then that's kind of how that all played out, and that's how I became politicized. And when you write your poetry, do you have a specific idea in mind, or do you just you know, is it something like you might be walking down the street and something hits you, you write a line, and then you build off of that? How do you? What's your workflow like? Well, usually when I come up with a little concept, it'll like I'll have like a little little phrase, and then it'll, and it'll, and then all of a sudden I'll start hooking around that. Um, but if you if you look at a lot of my poems, there's a lot of lists and stuff like that because you know I'm like kind of a history nerd. So that 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 makes it easy for me to like just be like you know and and Arizona and Colorado and Texas, you know, like just like you know. The, and so like so I always have so I oftentimes have these little little flows like these little these little um, killed Metacomet, killed Tecumseh, killed Kimrietta, killed John Brown, killed Nat Turner. So I had that for a long time, and that was actually part of a different poem. And then um, it was all of a sudden I came up with the concept here as a nation, um, and then all of a sudden I had here as a nation. Then it became part of Heroes Nation and worked much better there. Um, I got another poem called The Devil, and um, that one has like uh, um, war, famine, genocide, and the bottom line. Well, I had war, famine, and genocide, and the bottom line for a long time, but it wasn't until The Devil, um, the poem The Devil, that it made a lot of sense to put that right there. It's not until I have a, really, a point or, or some kind of real, something to really hang it on that, uh, that these lines um, become more than just lines, they become more than the sum of their parts. Awesomely enough, Matt was also one of the performers in our creative activism event here in LA a couple of weeks ago. Combining visual art, poetry, comedy, and music, we put on a fucking fantastic show at a brilliant underground gallery in the Boyle Heights neighborhood of Los Angeles called Facha Patoto. As I mentioned, Matt Cedillo was there to poetically weave a fuck you to the powers that be. Also in that medium was spoken word poet and musician Joey Flores. We had activist comedian Lee Camp, plus my band Rooftop Revolutionaries did an acoustic set. Top that off with a gallery covered in art curated by Art With Teeth, including pieces by Anthony Freda, 
Abby Martin, Hal Hefner, C.S. Stanley, and more. Take a look at some of the images from the event, and please, please, please feel free to take this idea and create your own. I guarantee it's one hell of an awesome and inspiring time. Moving right along as I'm trying to pack so much awesome into one show, Lily Hayden. Lily Hayden is a virtuoso violinist and activist. Whether she's creating sweeping scores for activist films or playing political events, her work is yet another powerfully beautiful example of artful activism. Last week, she performed at Healthcare for All, Medicare's 50th anniversary event in Los Angeles. So we headed downtown to capture some of the performance and talk to her about her work. Take a look. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us right after your show. I wanted to ask you, why did you feel that it was important to be here today? It's the only solution. This is an atrocity in America. The only you know, Western country without health care as a right for all people. And also on a personal note, my father died of cancer without health insurance. And it was too late by the time he went to the emergency room. So, so like that. Keeping it light. <laughs> right, well, that's the thing. It's like, it's very uh, heavy issues that you deal with. I mean, the, healthcare is not the only issue that you talk about, and yet your music has such an intense feeling of hope in, in it, in your words, in your playing. Um, how do you balance those things, like the intense issues with that message of hope? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, the same way you do, you know, art kills apathy. Uh, apathy isn't an option because you might as well just slit your throat right now if you're going to go there. Because, and actually, here's a, here's a little story for you. Uh, so I, I like to play at funerals. <laughs> no, I don't like to, but I, I you know, violin, you know. Uh, and I was at, I played for my friend's mom's memorial and the rabbi there, it was right around Hanukkah, and he said the story of Hanukkah is that, uh, that the temple was destroyed, and, uh, and in order to, to re-consecrate the temple, they only had enough oil for one night, so, but they burned it and it lasted for eight nights. So the, the rabbis, the sages say, why do we celebrate for eight nights when there was technically only seven nights of a miracle since they actually had enough oil for the first night? Um, and the answer is that the first night, the most uh, the biggest miracle was that in the face of the destruction of the temple, somebody actually thought to re-consecrate the temple. That they actually thought, all right, we're just going to fucking do this. And I think that's a quote from the Torah. Um, <laughs> you know, it's the human spirit. And this is what's beloved about humanity. Is This is what I love about human beings, that in the face of destruction, we think... I'll keep going, <laughs> you know, and that there's still something lovable that we can see, just a flicker of, of, of spirit. Where do you get your inspiration for these songs, and where do you find the hope in the midst of, of these issues as an activist? Really, it's just about sort of taking the spark and then being able to, you know, and that's why somehow uh, I was a poli-sci major, um, and I wanted to be a human rights lawyer, and 
Uh, and then I realized that I didn't have the stomach for it and that there might be actually more efficacy in, in opening people's hearts with music. And, uh, and I realized that when... Uh, keep, my theory is... <laughs> uh, my theory is that most bad behavior comes from people not... Uh, not feeling, not not feeling that they have enough, not feeling themselves, and so I think that what music does is it makes people feel themselves a little bit more. And when you start to feel yourself, you can feel the person in front of you a little bit more. And then when you can start to feel, you know, it's sort of, it's like just by, uh, it's kind of a a, a piece of attrition, <laughs> in a way. My mom used to say, my mom, the wonderful stand-up comedian Lotus Weinstock, used to say. Um, uh, you know, the Bible says, love your neighbors, you love yourself. But if you don't love yourself, your neighbor's in trouble. <laughs> um, if you don't like yourself, your neighbor's in trouble. So it starts with feeling and, and just feeling, you know, feeling your heart, feeling my heart, feeling your heart, and feeling your heart. Which is perfect because music and art has the tremendous ability to reach people emotionally before they have to think about something. So it sort of insidiously bleeds into the conscious after it's already hit you emotionally, um, which is very obvious when you listen to your music. Because if you don't feel anything after you listen to your music, then you have no soul or at least no central nervous system. So I'm curious, um, you released Lily Land last year. Uh, what are you working on right now? I am working on some music for a movie and a television show. So, um, so I like to infiltrate in all the different mediums uh, and new music. Um, and, you know, collaborating with different people. Uh, I'm always doing uh, activist work, always performing for some kind of cause. Um, oh, actually, just to speak to your last point, um, I th one of the reasons that I love to perform for causes uh, and why I feel that music has its place is that there's only so much time you can spend, uh, you know, from the neck up, um, and people go numb. If they don't, uh, if they don't feel it, then they're not receptive to the concepts, to the to the policies. Um, so I like to, you know, break your heart and then give you a little, you know, policy. <laughs> For more information on Lily and her work, check out LilyHayden.com. And that does it for this week's show. Thank you so much for watching. We will be back in the Devil's Den next week. And in the meantime, please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. As always, check out the last slide to see all of the sites that I mentioned in the show. There will also be a link to help support Occupy.com and the delicious descent delivered daily thanks to donations like yours. It is a 501c3, so anything you can contribute is tax deductible and hugely appreciated. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and subscribe on YouTube. From this awesome gallery atop an awesome bookstore in an okay city, good night and act out.